Welcome all, and thanks for joining us. So my name is Tim Jinan, and I am the founder of Factor. So at Factor, we're building solutions for advertising and GDPR, and we want to give consumers control and choice over data. So over the past 12 to 24 months, you've probably heard a lot about blockchain. Some of you might even have heavily invested in cryptocurrencies. So if you did, I hope you're still okay. But the first time I got introduced to Bitcoin was around 2011, when I was exploring the deep web and Silk Road with my freshly installed Tor browser. So I saw this little, little weird currency there under all the ads and under all the listings. And at that point, I would have never thought that the Bitcoin value would increase by so much. So I always realized the potential of decentralized and distributed technologies. And especially after I saw the big short, I realized that, yeah, there is definitely a need for a new uh, economical currency system. But blockchain is a lot more than that. And uh, I hope we're going to explore a lot of that today. So today we're going to explore blockchain and what the impact is on the advertising industry. So first up, we have uh, Alana from MetaX. We have James from Index and Adam from Truth joining the panel. And they will introduce themselves later. Um, some housekeeping. So right now, all microphones are muted. Uh, you uh, can ask questions for the Q&A segment uh, via the question box in the panel on your right side. Uh, be careful, it minimizes, so if you uh, feel free to expand it and then drop some questions in there. We will address them later. And uh, finally, this session is recorded and the recording will be shared with everyone uh, two hours after uh, this session. And it will also be posted on the IAB Euro website. So. Alana, I guess this is uh, your cue. Uh, yes. Good morning from Los Angeles, everybody. Um, I am Alana Gobert. I am the Chief Revenue Officer of MetaX. Uh, MetaX is a blockchain for advertising company, and we'll go through what that looks like and how it pertains to this conversation. And we can go to the next slide. So just to kick off and to start uh, for, the, for everyone on the phone, what is a blockchain? You know, there's a lot of debate and communication in the press, uh, in trade shows, and everyone seems to conflate blockchain and cryptocurrency. As Tim said, Bitcoin uh, earlier is a cryptocurrency built on top of a blockchain. And a blockchain, all it is, is a distributed ledger system. It's immutable. Uh, it's very hard to change especially because on public blockchains, every single copy of that blockchain instance is held on a node. And the efficacy of that chain system is the number of nodes in the network. And so the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain as an example, has thousands and thousands of nodes. If you wanted to change a node or change an entry, you have to change all of them at once. And the incentives for each node holder are quite different. Blockchain is a single source of truth. Back to the previous point, it's immutable, very hard to change. So when data is entered into it, it is locked in forever. Okay. Now, just, yep, thank you. Concepts in the blockchain. Cryptocurrency, as we discussed. Public versus private blockchains. So public blockchains are blockchains that are accessible to everybody. Blockchains like the Bitcoin blockchain. Ethereum. Ethereum is another blockchain flavor that supports something called smart contracts, which are basically scripts that you can run on top of the blockchain and build applications with. MetaX is built on Ethereum. And we mentioned nodes earlier. The nodes are part of the decentralized concept of blockchain. So everybody who spins up a node, it could be you in your home, it could be a corporation. You can install the chain and host a copy of the blockchain. And every person, every company, every instance of that node becomes part of the larger instance. And it makes it even harder every time you add a node to change the implementation. Next slide, please. Thank you. So for advertising in particular, Storage of impressions. Now, not every impression is equal, as we all know. And this is an example of an impression system that could potentially be used, just as an example, um, on the blockchain. 
So a buyer purchases an impression. That impression event is encrypted and is written to a block. And that block is broadcasted to every participant in the blockchain. Again, it goes back to the node, the node systems where every single node gets that broadcast and that block is written to everyone. The buyer's impression is verified and cleared, which means that that impression value is stored everywhere. The impression block is added to the blockchain. There's a consensus mechanism to the blockchain. We'll talk about it in a little bit. The impression block is now part of the permanent ledger. There's a verification process that you have to go through to write to the chain um, overall. And on public chains, you actually pay to play. So on Ethereum, there's a concept called gas. And if you want to write to the blockchain, you're not actually paying for any infrastructure. You don't have servers of your own that you're hosting to host the blockchain. You are paying the miners, you're paying the nodes uh, for their infrastructure costs. And so the gas price is what you're charged to write to the actual chain. Okay, now, in terms of storing things to the blockchain overall, especially the public blockchain, it is not smart or nor is it prudent to store every transaction onto the chain. I think it's $7 million to store one gig on Ethereum right now. What you do is you store things that are important. Things like if you have a discrepancy and you can trigger a smart contract when you write that discrepancy, if it hits over 25%, that's, an, that's a useful use of the blockchain. You're writing something that is a trigger, you're writing it to the chain, and you can trigger, let's say you trigger a smart contract on Ethereum to stop the campaign. So there's actually utility there to use the blockchain. The blockchain is not a storage database for all transactions. It's not what it's for. It's also not a storage database for PII if it's a public chain. I'm going to explain that in a second. So we can go to the next slide. Perfect. So regulatory use case. I think our favorite topics right now include GDPR and e-privacy. And I want to walk through quickly what MetaX has built. And we have built something called a token curated registry. Definitions on the screen. But really what a registry is in this case is a list of things. And in, in our case, the first registry, we'll go into it in a minute, is a publisher and advertiser whitelist that is curated by voting using tokens. And the MetaX token is called ad token. And ad token holders, and it could be anyone who buys them, it could be consumers, corporations, anyone in between. Ad token is available for purchase on a few of the crypto exchanges, as well as it will be available as well for AirSwap. We're launching the registry. The registry itself is called AdChain. We're launching that in beta, a full beta, this week. So to go back to the regulatory use case, you can also build token curated registries for more of the GDPR slash e-privacy use cases. And one of the more interesting ones we've been talking to with the IAB Europe community and others is a very simple way for consumers, users, to choose variables they would like to share with corporations. Now, anything that has to do with the list, anything that has to do with building consensus, uh, and voting, you can do that through a token curated registry. Now, you can also track things like opt-in, which you know is obviously very important right now, through the same mechanisms. So it's a very interesting way of bringing disparate voices together in one place to make decisions, to record activities, and to really speak with varying incentives in one voice. Okay, go to the next slide, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much. I uh, just to close out quick, briefly. Um, uh, TCRs is what, what we call key registries, and TCRs in the crypto community right now are the are very hot topic, and it's very important um, 
think for all communities and all, all verticals to understand the mechanisms. And I can happy to send out a white paper that, that gets into more detail uh, after this call. And thank you. Thank you, Alana. Um, I didn't really see any questions coming up besides uh, my sound was cut off. I had to translate that from uh, French, by the way. Uh, Alex, would you mind looking into that, please? No? Oh, yeah. Well, um, then we're going to move on with the panel session. Uh, so it will be myself as the moderator, um, Alana, who you just heard. Uh, James, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is James Prudhomme. I'm the uh, head of international for Index Exchange, uh, based here in London. Okay. Um, Adam? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Adam Hopkinson. I'm the chief operating officer and co founder of the blockchain media agency called Truth. Thank you. Um, we prepared a few questions, but also as a reminder, feel free to send in questions via the question box. Um, so first question, the hype. We saw it uh, over the last 12 to the 24 months. Is the hype real? So Adam, you want to take the question? Happily. Um, I think that in this instance, it is okay to believe the hype, but as long as we understood what it is that we're actually subscribing to. I think the uh, you've mentioned earlier on in the call today that people are uh, confluencing, I think the word was, um, getting confused between cryptocurrencies and blockchain. There, there is a lot of confusion between the two things, and uh, unfortunately, the cryptocurrencies are driving the hype. But the philosophy, philosophical um, uh, foundations of the blockchain is real, it's here to stay, and it is going to be genuinely a world-changing way that we're going to be doing all business moving forward. So for me, yes, let's believe the hype. Okay. So James, is the hype real now? Yeah, that's a good question. I, it's certainly, um, there's a number of problems within the digital advertising ecosystem that could potentially be solved by blockchain. Um, so I would say no, the hype is not real today. Um, but there are a lot of you know very smart, very uh, innovative startup companies that are that are looking for solutions to these problems and uh, and exploring blockchain as uh, as a potential foundation for those solutions. So in the end, I think that's a very good thing. Uh, and hype can sometimes uh, ultimately deliver reality. It sometimes just takes a little longer than everyone might think. Okay, and that's what we have the Gartner hype cycle for. Um, Alana, you're uh, one of those innovative, smart companies. Uh, when you deal with clients, are they asking you about the hype, and how do you, uh, like, how do you deal with those discussions? Because you actually build a lot already. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So, for us, it's very important. And I think I touched on it a little bit in my presentation. You know, the hype right now is stemming around tracking RTV impressions on the blockchain, um, and real-time transactions on the blockchain. Not a thing. Um, that is not feasible on a public chain. Now, we also touched briefly on private chains, which are privately hosted blockchains. And the issue with that is, you know, the, the beauty of blockchain is that the, it's the powers and the number of nodes that are available um, because it builds a larger consensus and it's harder to change the immutability of the chains. Um, when you have a private chain, you usually only have one or two nodes, and so hopefully, if it's a large bank, let's say, I'm sure it's much bigger, but you have to watch the efficacy of using blockchain versus um, the hype, as mentioned before. I think use cases like ourselves, other companies that actually have a product, um, look at what they're doing, because a lot of the time, it's very specific to a problem and not specific to a large macro solution. Okay, thank you. So, um... Let's see. Let's stay there. So, um, blockchain is very much about transparency. Uh, that's a bit different in a permission-based versus a public chain, but we will address that later. But why and how has the discussion shifted from AI, from AI to blockchain as a solution to fraud and transparency? That was free, Alana. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's totally fine. Why is it shifted from AI to blockchain and transparency? Is that the yeah? So yeah, two three yeah. years ago, we were all talking about AI and it's going to solve everything. Right now, blockchain is going to solve our problems. <laughs> it's going to also make our coffee in the morning. It's going to be amazing. Um, <laughs> I think. I think the problem is, and this is a hype cycle that every industry has. But I think the advertising ad tech community has it in a larger way. We have uh, the hype cycle of, of our press and our trade press. 
and we find a topic, and our data was a new block four years ago, AI, ML, and now blockchain, we need technology to move our industry forward. Now, AI and machine learning have not gone away, and actually, um, when it comes to blockchain, what the chains do and what our registries in particular do is they throw out something called, we call it dust. That dust is data. And you can use that dust to actually create amazing algorithms that you would not necessarily see from normal traditional ad tech installations and, and technology instantiations. So AI is still very much an, an ML. Now, AI in advertising is not actually the AI that we see in the movies, right? So that's number one as a hype factor, you know. <laughs> um, but I do think that the machine learning capabilities that we've built in advertising have affected other industries. So, but all of those things, AI, ML, and also blockchain are tied together now, and they're all equally as important. Thank you. James, you want to take a spin at that? Um, yeah, sure. I think that, um, you know, AI as a solution to the, to the fraud problem uh, is still a probabilistic solution, right? AI any AI system at its core is still a prediction system. It's, for example, predicting if an impression is fraudulent or not. So that means two things. It means one, you're gonna get false positives, and two, you're gonna get false negatives. Um, if, if sort of blockchain-based solutions become a reality, um, then potentially they could be seen as a more deterministic problem, or a de deterministic solution, rather, um, to the fraud problem. You know, but really there are other solutions to this. I mean, companies can open up their uh, existing log files to their clients at least. Um, there's ways of auditing these things. You know, one of the dangers with technology like blockchain and frankly like AI is when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And um, sometimes you have solutions that are looking for problems. Um, and the, you have problems where the solutions are actually very apparent and right in front of you. Um, and it's not necessarily requiring a, a net new system or a new technology to, uh, to solve that. You mean like header bidding? <laughs> like header bidding. Well, I would argue that <laughs> header bidding, uh, you know, the proof Sorry. was in the pudding. So the, uh, the results uh, speak for themselves on header bidding. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I think the, the discussion has shift, shifted from AI to blockchain as a solution to fraud simply because it's an easier concept to understand the blockchain than creating complicated algorithms to identify predictions, as you say. So I, I think the technology is getting simpler. But what I really like about this question is the, the fact that we've missed out the word ad in front of fraud. What blockchain will do is it will demonstrate actual fraud where people are overcharging for their services that they're offering clients. And that's what I really like about it. That's where we're focusing on the transparency. Okay, thanks. Then we'll keep the question to you. So how does blockchain impact programmatic then? To me? Yeah. Okay, so, well, the, the, the reason that we set up our, our business was so that we can allow our clients to see end-to-end -end through the pipes that are created for them. So they would have disclosed fees of intermediaries. They would see exactly what makes it through to publishers. Publishers can see exactly what's coming through the other way. And everybody understands what their value and what their place is in that ecosystem. And if everybody is operating on behalf of the clients, then we've genuinely created a transparent marketplace to deliver the services that the clients need. So that's how it's affecting programmatic to me, that it's stripping out unnecessary middlemen, bad practitioners and overbillers. Very clear. James, you want to add to that? Uh, sure. I mean, absolutely. Transparency is the goal, right? Um, but blockchain may not necessarily be the solution to that. The industry over the last two or three years, and, and I will say that header bidding has had a big impact on that, has become a lot more transparent uh, than it ever was. Um, uh, exchanges, for example, now have been forced to become completely transparent with their publisher clients and exactly what fees they are charging. Uh, and header bidding had a lot to do with that, right? Moving the entire industry into the header where there was fair and equal competition for inventory, uh, suddenly fees mattered. And so I would argue that, you know, blockchain could potentially have a large role to play in programmatic, but it's just, it's early days. 
Um, I don't think you need blockchain to be transparent. Uh, there's a couple, I mean, Index Exchange proves that, right? We've been transparent with our publishers for a very long time uh, and long before there was ever any thought of using blockchain in, uh, in programmatic. The other, the other sort of issue to address is that, um, you know, whenever you have an additive solution, and I think Adam said it very well, um, there's always an additional fee for that, right? We live in an era today where transaction costs are coming down Blockchain certainly in other industries outside of advertising shows a lot of promise in reducing the overall cost of transaction. Um, in programmatic, the overall cost of transaction is coming down already and it's coming down as a result of market forces. So if by adding blockchain vendors into the ecosystem um, as sort of an additive solution, somebody's got to pay for that. Ultimately, those costs will come out of the transactions and ultimately those costs will come out of the advertiser and publisher revenue. Yeah, one would argue that, you know, trust is good, but the verifying is, is better. So Alana, from, from your perspective, so James is describing, you don't necessarily need blockchain for this. And, and I agree, but uh, if you come back to trust, but verify is better. How do you look at that? Yeah, so the way we're using blockchain right now, Again, it uses tokens and the consensus mechanisms that are expanded in both the public chains and some of the blockchain systems. So what we're trying to solve for, very simply, is the bad actor syndrome. In our industry, I don't care which trade we're talking about um, or which company we're talking about, it's very hard to report bad actors. Um, so the registry that we've built with the token holders voting, publishers, advertisers, and tech partners in or out based on a consensus definition of quality actually brings to the forefront people's actions, people being corporations, be it a publisher, be it an advertiser, be it a tech vendor, et cetera. So we don't really have that right now. We do have companies that are focused, nonprofits that are focused on cleaning up fraud. Um, we have trades that are, are working with members that they reported about, they reported about doing something in, in the ecosystem. You know, there's a conversation to be had, but the, the, the incentives are not aligned to really talk about that actors publicly in, in our world. So just to start, I don't care if it's header bidding. You know, header bidding has its own issues with, with scripts and people hard coding themselves into the header uh, to bid first. This, uh, that's stopped now, but you know, there's been growing pains with all of these technologies. Um, there needs to be ways to call that out because none of those things were public. Um, there are always inside baseball in our world. So there needs to be ways, and this is what the registry is for, to think, talk about that behavior and to publicly vote folks in and out based on that quality definition. So that's what we're up to. Um, and then, you know, we don't charge for that. That's free because uh, we have a service of business on top of that that is very separate from, our, from the, the registries themselves. Okay. And you mentioned the gas earlier, and, and James, you mentioned, mentioned the cost of transactions. But uh, from my knowledge, I think uh, a transaction on the Ethereum ring uh, is like 144 in dollars. Um, how do you deal with that if the cost is so high? Yeah, it's not that. So you, there's a site you can look at to pay uh, gas, and you can look at gas prices. It's not 144. It depends on the day. It could be five cents. It could be five dollars. It could be 144. It could be nineteen thousand um, dollars. During our TGE, uh, we we sold our tokens. There were people who were paying, I think, 19 grand at some at one point because it was so busy to buy tokens. Um, so it really depends on the congestion on the public networks. Now, on the private networks, there is no no notion of gas, right? And so you know the public chains. To go back to the hype part public chains, the Bitcoin blockchain, and Ethereum are working on ways to make that gas price lower. And in the meantime, okay. folks like Hyperledger are working on more of those private solutions. Okay, but with a private solution, I, I would argue indeed that it's uh, cheaper and easier to run and more scalable, but don't you lose the transparency argument there? You have transparency in the network. Uh, you just couldn't you, could, you just could, couldn't share out to the public, right? So there's a there's a Lots of um, public sharing, so Ethereum obviously is, is public to anyone who has an Ethereum node or a UI. Uh, so, it, you know, it's across the world, anybody can see it. Um, the private chains, it really depends on what its purpose is. If it's, if it's bank financials, you want a private chain. <laughs> you don't want to put it out onto the public ledger. Not a good idea. So it really depends. It depends on the trade-offs. 
Okay. And uh, Adam, how do you look at it from your perspective? Is, is cost an issue here? No, absolutely not. Um, we, we've built, um, I, I really don't want to go into the, the, the mechanics of it. I think I'd probably prefer to have my CTO here to do that. But cost is not an issue for any part of our use of the blockchain at all. Okay. Um, next question. So speed and scan. I also, by the way, I see these questions coming in. So thank you everyone for submitting them. Uh, I'm trying to work them in, uh, but if not possible, I'll wait to the end. But one of the questions we had is so speed, uh, speed, scalability and costs are often quoted as downsides of blockchain. Uh, what solutions do you guys see and, and how you deal uh, uh, with these limitations? And Adam, I'm going to start with you. Okay, so yeah, scalability is obviously an issue, especially for a startup business. But the the solution that we've built already is already in version 0.1, able to process 100,000 transactions per second. So we are fairly confident that we're going to be able to manage all of the demand that we are expecting in the next 12 months. And over the next 12 months, technology will speed up. So we feel that we're ahead of the game on that. I think we've solved for scalability, but it is an issue. Okay, James. Uh, it, I mean, absolutely, scalability is an issue, <clears throat> and as we all know, it's very expensive to operate infrastructure. And with all due respect to Adam, I mean, a hundred thousand transactions a second doesn't even get us started um, when you look at the overall scale of the programmatic ecosystem and the overall transaction volume. Um, <clears throat> so, again, while I think that there are potentially solutions. Um, that blockchain can provide to some of the problems. Um, if, if transparency is the goal, then just open up log files. Um, there's a number of ways that companies can do that. To Alana's point um, around companies voting, companies vote today by choosing the partners that they want to work with and discarding the ones that they don't want to work with. Um, Ads.text went a lot further to solving the, pro the fraud problem than just about any other solution we've seen. And that was a very simple deployment of a text file uh, in a publisher's root domain. So uh, I think all of these, uh, you know, potentially innovative blockchain solutions are really, really interesting. I just don't see them necessarily as having a lot of practicality in the ecosystem today. And we could still be several years out before, um, before any of these become a reality. Yeah, that might be true, but I, I think are you are you not overlooking the decentralization part? Elena, maybe you want to join in there. Yeah, I, I so I think that there's a lot of buzzwords in our industry, and I worked on ads.txt and I ran the tech lab. Ads.txt is the first step to be really clear, and everyone keeps using it as this panacea. <laughs> it's a text file on a web server. It can be circumvented very easily, everyone. Um, so just be really careful when we talk about that publicly because that, that's, that's a real thing. Um, in terms of uh, decentralization, there's a whole movement within the crypto community. And one of, my, one of my goals right now, as just as a advertising slash crypto bridge, is to bring all that work into the ad tech community. I think it's very faulty to consider blockchain and crypto solutions to be uh, long term and future, I have governments who are calling us looking to implement blockchain solutions. We have hedge funds who are calling us looking to implement blockchain solutions. Uh, and, you know, there are cities going onto the blockchain and using it for ledger systems. So just be careful. Um, the the mar market cap of, of crypto goes above the digital advertising global spend number uh, multiple times a year. So the market is, is large, right? And so in terms of decentralization, the miners that are running these, these nodes and the public chains are running vast infrastructures. And the way, they're, the way it's actually being built, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, very decentralized, not one point of central point of truth, the way that architecture is built has fundamentally changed the way a large part of the internet is communicating, full stop. No, I think Tim mentioned Silk Road earlier. You know, it's an example of an exchange, uh, an audio exchange, that that sold goods and services at a, in a large scale way and moved product across the world. Now, that was a first step. Um, now we have a whole infrastructure doing so many different things together and also separately, with no throat to choke. 
that's a big deal. So, uh, uh, said, not also, so yeah, James, if you want to comment, go for it. Sure. I, I, look, I don't disagree with anything Alana just said. Um, I think that blockchain and cryptocurrencies are going to have a huge impact on uh, certain sectors of the economy. I think, you know, to your question about decentralization, Tim, there's a number of um, industries where trust is completely centralized into one platform. And in cases where trust is centralized into one platform, absolutely there is room for decentralized systems to disrupt that um, and and to make those platforms a lot more equitable and frankly a lot cheaper to operate um, however that's not really the case and we're here to talk about specifically about the advertising industry that's not really the case in advertising right if you look at programmatic um, the the sad perhaps unfortunate reality is that nobody trusts anybody um, advertisers have dsps Publishers work with ad servers and work with exchanges. Um, all of them operate um, different ledgers and all of them are forced to come together to kind of true up those ledgers. So trust is not necessarily centralized into one platform. And I don't think there's, ne there's a lot of room to disrupt those platforms through decentralization. Other industries, absolutely. Financial services, no question. Tons of room in the property market, for example. I think Alana alluded to cities. Um, moving transactions onto the blockchain, lots and lots of value to be created there. Um, I would just argue that the programmatic advertising business uh, is not necessarily one of those industries. Yeah, but I would argue, and I will give the question uh, or the reply to, to Adam. Won't brands at one point in time say, guys, whatever you do for me, I want you to register all these impressions uh, into a ledger for me? Adam? Yeah, yes, I completely believe so. And I think. I think that whatever position that you take in the supply chain for programmatic, you are working on behalf of the client. You need to remember it's their money. You need to remember that they have a right to see what's going on. That's why we built our system to be able to deliver that. So I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, sure, I, I, I agree. agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, agree I agree as well. I also want to say one thing. You know, at a macro level, our industry is very much built on a few companies being trusted. Programmatic is not indicative of the entire advertising industry, and it's also going to be changing, especially as ads.tex weeds out middlemen that are reselling, right? And ads.tex, you know, the beauty of that application is there are going to be companies that get squeezed out because of the fact that they're making money off the backs of the principals. So, you know, I think that, that there'll be the, the trustless world. Decentralization means trustless, right? Mm -hmm. And in terms of our industry, there are companies that are trusted and they are the macros hubs and the programmatic companies are those folks. So I want to make sure that we are very clear on how the market works because there are, there are two companies that are really are the ones that drive a lot of that technology and the rest are just the spokes. Okay. Uh, Adam, if you go towards, uh, if you, you walk into a, a client meeting, I'm going to assume that they are waiting for you with open hands and then waiting for you to, to make everything transparent. So I'm going to fill in the answer a bit here, but that's probably not true, right? Um, there's, a, there's a degree of open arms. Um, if we can deliver a, uh, an increased degree of transparency and trust into a business that they're investing a lot of money in, then yes, we do get um, we do get greeted with open arms. However, um, and as you'd expect with any emerging technology, there's often a degree of skepticism about it, and I would say fairly healthy skepticism. Okay, and then let's discuss the elephant in the room because if the cryptocurrency bubble bursts, which kind of happened already, but let's see how it goes. How, if at all, will that impact blockchain technology? Alana, you mentioned governments, you've mentioned uh, cities. Uh, I have the same experiences. We're being approached, even though we're advertising, we're being approached from many different sides. But how will this impact the, 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 uh, the adoption and the further development of blockchain? Yeah, so I think the cryptocurrency piece is very separate from the blockchain piece. Now, there are companies, this company called Kadena, that's working on multi chain computation that is very separate from any of the crypto. Um, tokens or coins, if you will. So I, I would separate those two things out uh, because there are, there are companies that are investing in the ledger systems that are not at all invested in the cryptocurrency piece. I mean, Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of Morgan Chase, I saw him at Davos this year, 
and he was very bullish on blockchain itself, but obviously and indicatively, uh, he's a U.S. banking company, he was very anti-crypto. That's okay. <laughs> all right, that's all right. It could be separated. Okay. And then, Adam, are you guys uh, releasing your own token? What should? No, um, we are not going to do anything with that for the verification platform that we've built at all. It's no need for a public token. Yeah. Okay. James, comment from your side? Sure. I, I mean, I certainly agree with Alana that um, the cryptocurrency uh, aspect and the blockchain can be completely separated. Um, blockchain can be used as a solution in many situations where payments are not required or where there's no requirement for a currency. Um, I will say that a number of problems exist within the advertising ecosystem around payments. And let's not forget that despite uh, the fact that in programmatic, for example, transactions are conducted in real time, auctions are conducted in real time. Um, however, payments are not conducted in real time. Uh, payments can take a long time. They have to be processed through banks. Currencies have to be exchanged. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of weight on those transactions today. Um, maybe one day, um, you know, cryptocurrencies will have an impact on that, and maybe one day payments can be made a lot more fluid. Uh, it doesn't sound like anyone's really working on that part of the problem too much. Perhaps I'm wrong, and maybe MetaX is. Um, but I would say that um, you can definitely separate currency from blockchain. However, people should not overlook currency as a potential solution to some of the problems that we have in the ecosystem today. Yeah, I'm going to throw in a question from the audience here. So is blockchain and digital advertising already in use or is it a theoretical concept so far? And, and if there are there real use cases? Are there like real uses where I can pay with crypto or in like in, in digital advertising? What's running already? Yeah, so, so I think the problem is everyone keeps going back to the payments of the and the impression counting piece. So our our registry is live and in use, but it is a list of things on the blockchain, right? So yes, uh, Meta X registries are live. Uh, they're going fully live this week, and the token holders will start voting folks in or out. Again, voting systems, right? Not just RTB and not just impression tracking. So let the other folks talk about their solutions. Absolutely. Thank you. That's great to hear. We are live as well. So the Truth Agency is already operating its blockchain. It announced its first campaign at Ad Week in March in London this year, and we are in tests with multiple people now. So it's here. Okay. Um, I. I I saw the announcement on, on LinkedIn. I saw the, the, the picture of the, the, the screen and I was looking at the schematic for the campaign and I couldn't help thinking, is this really better? Well, it, it was better in that it set out to resolve an issue, which it then did resolve. And that was for the client that we were working with, wanted to see where their money was going and what was happening to it in the middle. And then also verifying that it goes exactly where it's supposed to be going and then not somewhere else. Um, those are the objectives that we set out to deliver, which was our very first uh, iteration of the tech, and it's working. We are now working with other people on more advanced um, projects. Okay, thank you. Um, well, gardens, should they adopt blockchain? <laughs> it's a large question. <laughs> yeah, um, let's uh, <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the wall garden piece, and this, this goes back to data, and I think you know the movements within Europe uh, overall, there are very specific use cases for data, data sharing, variable sharing that need to be addressed uh, with the current legislation looming um, with via GDPR and e-privacy. So I think that there are ways to use blockchain to help bring in, again, I come from the voting system side, right? So my mind is bringing in consensus and ideas from the community and their user base in a different way. It's very difficult. Voting is very difficult. Um, and it's been proven because we're getting phone calls from a ton of different folks, advertising folks, hedge funds, governments, what, what have you, just for the voting system that we built. Um, and I think that you can use blockchain to record those ideas around, should I share this variable, age and gender with my corporation or not? And then open it up to your token holders and bring in information. So, um, so I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. James, you want to take a crack? 
Um, sure. I mean, maybe give me a second. Can you repeat kind of how the yeah, sure. uh, how the question? Um, so, so one of the questions, uh, you know, should the walled gardens uh, use blockchain or not? And then maybe from my perspective, and so the, uh, my biggest validation of blockchain was always that I didn't read anything about Facebook or Google or Amazon adopting blockchain. And to me, that was like, sure. okay, so it is a threat. But sure. well, what's your thinking? From a programmatic perspective, I would say that the walled gardens need to be more transparent. Um, and in general, there needs to be more transparency. So if blockchain ends up being the best way for them to do that, then absolutely um, they should be opening their systems up to blockchain solutions. Um, however, as I said earlier and a few times before, I don't think that blockchain is necessarily um, the only requirement for transparency. So I won't go so far as to say, yes, the, the walled gardens should um, open themselves up to blockchain, but I will say that the walled gardens do need to be more transparent. Okay, Adam? Um, I, I agree with James there. Um, you know, I, I, I don't work for one of the World, Ga World Gardens, so I'm not really a, you know, directly familiar with what their issues are. So I can't say that it will be a cure-all for them, but all businesses at the minute in our world need to deliver trust back into their, um, into their manner of being. And I think if blockchain delivers that, then, then it's a yes. But I can't say yes without knowing what the problems are. Okay. Um, as far as the, the public part, I'm going to wrap this up now. I'm going to look at the questions uh, from the audience, and then we're nicely in time. So uh, please bear with me when I filter through this in real time. Uh, here we have this. Uh, yeah, well, we didn't really touch on the topic of GDPR, and I think uh, some of the questions are related here. So I'm going to, one of the questions is, is storing any advertising and data in such distributed way a, treat, uh, a threat to privacy? Uh, what about the right to delete data? Who wants to take this one? I'll take that one because I'm working on the working group. <laughs> so <laughs> at, least, at least to start, at least. So the, the blockchain installations are not, not for PII. Um, you can create pointers that go down to offline databases that are and, uh, holding any PII that ties to a user, right? So the notion of writing to a blockchain, um, and I, I've heard this question a million times from reporters now, where you can't change anything, so it must be not compliant with GDPR is false. Um, it's just the way you store data and, and point your pointers down to the offline databases to make sure that you can delete what you need to be, what needs to be deleted. Okay, thanks. Next question, when you encrypt an impression event and represent it as a block, does it slow down the delivery of, or delivery of the ad in real time? Adam? Yeah, I can take this one. In, in the example that we've built and executed, it has no effect on the delivery of the impression. Okay, because it's a similar, uh, sorry, it's a, a separate stream or? Well, um, go, going back to, to James's point earlier on about you know 100,000 um, transactions per second not being big enough to deliver solution for all of programmatic, I do agree with that, but it is big enough to deliver what I need to, and we've got the computing uh, capability and the transaction speed to be able to execute programmatic campaigns for the clients that we're working with now and deliver no material lag to what they're doing. Okay, so here are an interesting question. So what, are, what are the elements in programmatic advertising that can be decentralized? And so for example, ads.txt could be one of them, but what are the other opportunities? Where do we see need for decentralization in the programmatic space? I would, I would argue that um, there probably is need for decentralization in the user data layer. Um, there's a lot of user data that's centralized today within large platforms that users um, have no transparency into and no control over. Um, so there probably are um, you know, legitimate use cases that, that could scale and whether they can you know, be GDPR compliant or not, or whether they can uh, fit within the framework that GDPR is slowly evolving into, uh, that I, I think it's too early to tell. Um, but I believe that anything that empowers the user um, to take more control over their own data is a really positive thing. And there's probably a lot of space for uh, innovation in there. I agree. So yep. regarding transparency, well, sorry, Adam, do you want to add to that or? 
No, I was going to say that I absolutely completely agree. Great. Uh, regarding transparency, one of the difficulties is, is the existence and the inconsistencies among different counting slash measurement methodologies. So in the end, ad servers and different tags will provide different set of impression counts. Uh, like beyond creating a public registry based on a single source of information, is there any way blockchain can help in resolving this? So that's the discrepancy problem, <laughs> not necessarily the transparency problem. Um, there may be ways for blockchain to help solve the discrepancy problem, um, but the discrepancy problem, as many of us know, has been around for a very, very long time. And um, I think that those two discrepancies and transparency do intersect at some point. Um, it's very difficult to um, take two discrepant reporting systems and try to merge them together if the if the the the, the two companies that control those systems are not willing to you know expose their log files so to speak. Um, but certainly yeah, if somebody yeah, sorry, please continue. Well certainly um, discrepancies continue to be an issue in, in digital advertising, not just in programmatic. And um, you know, again, there may be ways for uh, one day for blockchain to provide solutions there. I think we talked about it a little bit. So th there are ways to use public chains and also just Ethereum in particular because there is the notion of smart contracts. You can upload and write to the chain when there is a large discrep, right? So you can trigger an event to write to the chain and then trigger a smart contract um, to think about ways to deal with discreps, right? Because I think that's where that's a short-term gain to think about how things are working. Right now, discrepes are very hard to be dealt with, to James's point, because there's so many of them, and it's so rampant that you know individuals who are watching the campaigns follow the same process, which is, oh, discrepancy, let's get on the phone call and figure out how to deal with this, and oh, the contract say, that is just a disaster, right? So there are ways to, to have short-term gains using smart contracts, writing only negative, negatives to the chain, not positives. Um, to at least start that, to fix that, that problem. I think there's interest, uh, it's interesting there as well because you know you don't necessarily need to write those transactions in real time or anything near real time, quite frankly. Um, right. So you can have real time systems that are operating and you can have another system that kind of runs adjacent to or alongside of that um, that allows people to get um, you know a common view of the ledger, if you will, which potentially shows promise for solving some of the discrepancy problems. And it sounds like, you know, Alana and Tim, and I mean, we've all been in this industry for a very long time and have spent a lot of hours on those calls that Alana alluded to trying to, trying to figure these problems out. Yeah, but I, to my point, I, I think blockchain isn't meant to solve this problem. It's, it's meant to, to create more transparency. So where do you see discrepancies? And a very, um, right now, very often, you see discrepancy between party A and B. You don't see the discrepancies over uh, a multitude of, of, of companies. And it would be good to have a bit more insight to that. But technologically, I don't think blockchain is a solution to make discrepancies go away. Um, you're a bit more of a technical one. So uh, someone here says 100,000 uh, transactions per second actually sounds very impressive. Congratulations. MasterCard can only do about 9,000. Ethereum blockchain can do a max of about 20. What kind of computing power do you need for a blockchain-based solution that can that can deliver 100,000 uh, transactions per second, or is it a different non-blockchain, uh, sorry, non-blockchain but still transparent system? It, it, it's a uh, thank you for the question and thank you for the uh, the acknowledgement there. Um, it's a it's a it's basically it's a blockchain, but it's not any of the blockchains that are familiar with anybody. So this is our own technology that we've developed. Uh, it's not Bitcoin blockchain, it's not an Ethereum blockchain, it's not going to get taken down by public misbehavior, it's a more secure environment that we feel. Yeah, so it is a private chain, right? At the moment, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I can say to that is today, Index Exchange is conducting something like 50 billion transactions a day, um, and we operate across nine different data centers around the world um, well in excess of 250,000 server cores. Um, so that begins to give a sense of the kind of infrastructure you need to conduct uh, transactions at that kind of scale, regardless of whether they're being written to a blockchain or, or, or being written to a traditional database. 
Yeah, I get that, and, and you're quite right, and there is a huge difference in the scale size here, but I'm actually interested in solving the issue for my clients, not for everybody right now. <laughs> okay. Um, last question. So um, we mentioned Hyperledger. I think I've heard Ledger also, but are there any standards in blockchain at this point in time? Yes, Long there yeah. are. <laughs> Um, there are trade associations specifically focused on block, crypto slash blockchain. Um, there's the EEA, which is the Ethereum version. Um, there are others that are working on token as well as, as blockchain standards. Um, and we're working with IAB Europe, obviously. Uh, I think it's important to note that the blockchain standards are more on the ledger side. Um, the crypto standards are very separate from that. Um, and um, I'm working on a different track, both in Brussels as well as the US and overseas in Asia, to work on more of a crypto standard with government. Um, and that's a very different conversation because it's, it has to do with securities. But we are also working on blockchain standards, yes. Okay. That was it for today. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for the participation and uh, being transparent. Uh, <laughs> I hope it was an enjoyable panel for the rest of the people on the phone. And uh, to conclude, I would like to highlight uh, IAB the, the Interact event uh, in Milan this year. It's on the 23rd and 24th of May. Uh, and there will also be a dedicated panel on blockchain there. So if you're interested, tickets are still available. Uh, head over to the IAB Europe website. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Yeah.